a kind of a quick um, uh, browse through all the different topics. And then we will have questions at the very end. And the seminar is ongoing until 10 o'clock. So we have about 75 minutes of presentation and maybe 10 minutes for questions. Um, and I first would like to welcome Dr. Anna Pernestol. She is the director of ITRL at KTH to introduce the topic. Welcome, Anna. Hey, yes, thank you very much, uh, Peter. Uh, so we know that we need to phase out and even, or that we need to decrease and even phase out CO2 emissions. Uh, from uh, to reach the climate goals. Uh, and we know also that transportation and in particular heavy transportation is one really challenging sector. Um, and to, to reach the goals of zero emissions from uh, transportation and heavy transport, I, we will need to, uh, to use several different tools. Electric roads is one of those tools uh, and uh, electric roads are currently industrialized uh, in, and implemented, scaled up in Germany. So it's uh, that's a proof that the, this technique has has kind of left the research state and is, is now scaled up and broadly used. And in October this year, uh, the govern, government, the Swedish government, gave the National uh, Transportation Administration in Sweden the task to, to make a plan for a sustainable development and rollout of 3,000 kilometers of electric roads by 2035. And those electric roads should contribute to half the emissions from heavy transport. So it, is, uh, it could be a really an important tool to reach uh, the climate goals. Uh, however, electric roads, as you will learn today, uh, is definitely not the quick fix. It will require new infrastructure, new types of vehicles, new business models, and um, really clever planning to get this working. Um, and to, to, uh, to reach the goals and make a successful implementation, uh, we need to use an integrated approach uh, to really look at the different perspectives and get them together, to, to get the puzzle pieces uh, fit together and, and uh, yeah, really obtain what we are what what we need to uh, to obtain with the zero emissions. Uh, therefore, I'm uh, happy and proud and and also very excited to be here to together with you this morning, um, to uh, and together with six experts uh, from different perspectives of electric roads. Uh, the experts will explain electric roads from various perspectives uh, for us this morning. And our uh, moderator, Peter, he has already introduced himself, uh, but he, um, he is from Integrated Transport Research Lab and uh, participated in forming some of the first pilots on electric roads uh, in Sweden. Um, so, yeah, and I, I hope you will enjoy the, the morning and uh, learn a lot of different perspectives on electric, uh, electric roads uh, together with us. Uh, so, Peter, uh, uh, guide us through this uh, webinar. Okay, thank you, Anna. Thanks for the introduction, yeah. Okay, I will not spend much time on, uh, on my own, so I would like to start by addressing the question, what is an electric road? And for that, we have two speakers. And we will begin with Karin Ebbinghaus, CEO of Elon Road. And she's also an electric road enthusiast. Karin, can you tell us a bit about what is an electric road from your perspective? I will be happy to do that. But uh, before that, I'd like to share my screen. So you could um, hopefully see this. The yes, classical uh, digital meeting question. Do you see my presentation? Perfect, perfect. Thank you so much for having me, Anna and team. Yes, I'm an electrical road enthusiast and I'm glad to be presented as an expert. I do have a bit of a different background to most of you on the panel. Uh, I'm not an engineer, I'm not a researcher. I used to be a lawyer, although I do have a master in maritime and transportation law. 
but foremostly I'm a big consumer of transportation and I guess in that capacity I'm also here and I used to work as an investor scouting for CO2 reducing innovations and then I came across this company which I'm now working at and thought that this is part of the paradigm shift that we are looking at for uh, transportation. And I would like for you to picture yourself and imagine a future that is fossil free and you can drive with unlimited range and never have to stop to refuel or recharge. And if we have that perspective and that vision, I think when we look upon electrification of roads, we need to sort of rethink and redesign how we, our, our behavior and, and, and looking into that. Uh, and before I jump into what electrical roads really are, I think we could zoom out a bit. That's um, appropriate now when we're on Zoom and look on why we do have and why the, there is a need for electrical roads. And the purpose of electrical road is really to have sustainable transportation. As Anna introduced, we need to address this issue before we, if we are, uh, want to be able to meet the goals of the Paris Agreement. And what is driving this? Of course, it's climate change. And I think that is unarguable, uh, even if you're not the researcher, that uh, unless you're the former president of the United States, there is uh, a challenge with uh, climate change. And pollution, of course, transportation caused pollution. And, and we can see in the light of, of COVID-19 that uh, we have uh, received better air quality in cities when we have lesser transportation. But I don't think it's sustainable to think that we will have less traffic once um, life will return sort of back to normal. But we also need to manage uh, how we use and consume energy and the raw materials that are uh, consistent in, in some of the solutions, for example, in batteries. And we do have congestion. So if we look upon these drivers um, of, of uh, sustainable transportation, I think that you would find that electrical roads will solve most of them. It's not like the overall fix, but it's a great contributor. Because when we look upon electrification uh, uh, of transportation, and I must admit these really nice pictures, I've been uh, sort of handed by a colleague to you, Magnus, actually at Scania, Reno Filia, who was um, the opponent of a dissertation here in, in Lund for uh, actually on electrical roads last Friday. Uh, we need to understand vehicles as part of a system. Uh, and I will come into more of that later. But it will increase the demand for electrical power and it will have a massive increase for batteries. Uh, and that's not so sustainable. So we need to balance this. So we don't want to introduce one new technology that will cause a new problem. Because electrical roads is a system that can transfer power in motion, but it can also do it standing still to different kinds of vehicles. But it really consists of three parts. You cannot look upon electrical roads as, as one single element because it's really three parts. It's the roads, of course, but it's also the energy system and it's the vehicles. And you need to work this as a unity to understand the purpose and the meaning and the benefits of an electrical roads. And really actually what we put on the roads, the uh, either if it's overhead or underground, which I will uh, talk about later, it's really only one third of the cost of implementing such a system because you will have the grid and the, the electricity connections and also the vehicles. They are part of what it costs to, to have electrical roads. But then again, you don't really have to have special vehicles to drive on electrical roads. You need electrical vehicles with batteries. So there are different technologies, of course, to have, have this. You have three different alternatives as we see it today. You have overhead conductive, ground conductive, and ground inductive. And I think that uh, I, will, I will go through the different uh, technologies and describe what this, the, the positive and the negative aspects of each. So overhead conductive power supply. And uh, this is uh, probably the most mature technology and it has been tested for quite some time. And, and as Anna said, it's been uh, rolled out in, in Germany for some stretches and, and we have tested it here in Sweden as well. And it, for me, I'm not an engineer, as I said, for me, it's, it's like taking the train to the road. And uh, you will have the, the positive effect is that you have 
use this technology for quite some time when it's verified and you can transfer high high powers uh, so you will be able to target the heavy transportation which will need a high power trans uh, transmission but on the negative side um, it has a quite large visual uh, impact on, on the, the nature and, and the surroundings. Um, you cannot really use it in cities, but so it's designated for highways. And it's not applicable to all vehicles. It will target one problem and, and it's heavy, heavy transportation. Um, and I will come back to that more later. If we look at the ground conductive power supply, there are some different solutions to that, uh, but it, it all uh, has the effect that you have the power transmission underneath the vehicle and you have a receiver that will come in physical contact with the road to be able to transfer medium to high, high powers. Um, and it, the, the pros is that you will not have so uh, large visual impact uh, on the surroundings. Uh, you, you barely notice it, but on the negative aspect, it's still an emerging technology. It has been tested in different uh, atmosphere, but it's not um, perhaps re ready to scale up uh, a large stretch directly. It will take a few years before, before it's validated, but it has definitely left the research phase and it's, it's ready to uh, be demonstrated in um, live city environments. And um, there are also ongoing uh, European standardization of how to do this. But on the negative side, of course, there will be some wear and tear uh, on the equipment because you do have physical contact. Uh, then we have a, a third alternative, which is ground inductive power supply. And uh, for me, not again, being an engineer, I always thought that uh, uh, inductive is uh, the future, uh, but then I've learned that it has its limitations also. It has its, uh, of course, advantages because you will not have any contact. So wear and tear is, is not um, an issue here. And it's, of course, very visually appealing. You will, you will not notice it. But then again, you will not be able to, to transfer as high uh, power effects as you do with, with conductive. And of course, it will take some um, uh, impact on the road construction because you have to dig it down and have it underneath the asphalt. But there are also ongoing tests, both in Sweden and other places in, uh, in, uh, in the world. And I think that we will see over the coming years that uh, hopefully we will learn from these tests that we are doing at the moment. And I'm, I'm really proud to be, be Swedish actually, to have a, a traffic administration who are um, brave and curious enough to be able to test different solution because they will have different advantages and different uh, negative aspects. And if we want to really uh, learn something, we need to test it in live environment. Uh, and so the, uh, I would say hat off to the Swedish government and the traffic authority who has taken this decision to do several tests. And I think over the years, perhaps we will take the benefits from the different system and, and merge it into one perfect system. Uh, because what is the benefits of an electrical road system? I mean, it will increase your range. Uh, as I said before, imagine this feeling of having unlimited uh, driving distance. But it can also mean that you have smaller batteries if you have access to ongoing charges. There are studies showing that we can reduce battery sizes between 50 and 80 percent. And that will have a huge CO2 impact. And also, uh, it could be benefit from the uh, from an energy management perspective if we can allocate and use uh, energy uh, over the hours and, and use it both during day when you can have renewable energy and you can consume it. And perhaps you can have batteries, the, the vehicle batteries as a gigantic energy storage system to use later on. And it will save you time. I'm, I'm not sure about you. But personally, today it's raining and I had low on gas. I'm driving a gas still because I have range anxiety and I had to just stop and uh, take time to, to refill it. And that will, so we will save time by this. And, and for me, I mean, that's convenience, but from commercial traffic transportation, we're actually having uh, people employed, that's a cost and you will save cost for that. And of course, sharing is caring. If we have infrastructure that could be used by more users that will be more cost benefits and here is uh, the co2 emissions from road transportation in sweden from 2016 and you can see 
that uh, long haul truck doesn't stand for the majority. It's really personal cars that stands for the, the, the vast majority of CO2 emissions. So if we can have systems that could solve both of them, um, that of course would be most beneficial from an environmental perspective. And that's something I think should really drive this uh, development is if we always have the lenses on what shall we do that reduces the most CO2 from transportation. So to conclude my introduction here, um, I would say that road, electrical roads turn range anxiety into range happiness and also limiting the carbon footprint of transportation. Thank you so much. Thank you, Corinne. That raised a lot of questions in my head, but I will save them for later. That was a very good introduction and the overview of the technology. So you have answered what is an electric road. Super good. Now I'd like to turn the question to Magnus. Magnus at Scania. Magnus is head of charging solution and infrastructure, sales and marketing at Scania. And Magnus, tell us a bit, what is an electric road heavy duty vehicle and how do you from Scania view electric roads? Thank you, Peter. And uh, yes, I will answer that question straight away. And there are no electric roads vehicles. So what I mean with that is uh, that we, we, we work, Let's see if I can change screen here. Yeah. So what I mean with that is that we, we at Scania work very heavily on electric electrification and electric drives uh, going forward. So we have our modular system and that is what we continue to develop. So in the future and from start uh, the last two, three years, we have started to, to roll out this new modular system. So we start with, without engines, uh, but we will have electric machines and, and gearboxes instead. We'll have different kind of different sizes of batteries that also is modulus as everything else. So it suits our customers. And we now introduce also charging interfaces as a module system. So we have two, uh, the CCS today and upcharge for buses. But there are also then future standards that we look into that are candidates to get into the modular system. And uh, that could be like the MCS for mega charging and Chaoji in, in, uh, in Asia, uh, but also electric road standards that could be implemented. So we we continue to work on the on this in this way, and therefore it's um, I wouldn't say easy, but it's uh, it's uh, possible to integrate new performance step into this. And we also add uh, charging solutions that's more connected services uh, to to really enhance and. Uh, the e-mobility solution. So we see that we go outside our vehicle. So it's more on a system level. And uh, to, to push this a bit, I would say that we see that battery electric vehicles will be the main path going forward, both from a society cost of view, but also from a customer point of view uh, during the 2020s, I would say. So I think this is very promising and, and uh, uh, that, that we're going in this direction. And I just want to put charging in, in some sort of context because charging and the range excited that Karin mentioned will be the defining factor for many, many years uh, when we implement a new application. So it will be needed to charge when it suits the customer. Uh, and uh, that means it will be depot charging and, and in the fleet uh, and in the depots, we will have destination charging at distribution center. And when you load and unload, when you stop anyway, and you will have public charging with the stationary uh, charging stations and you have opportunity charging for buses, for instance. And also uh, one way of doing this is on road charging. So I think that this is more how we see it and it will be different for different customers. 
a truck is not a truck. It's, it's a big uh, difference between a construction truck or a long haul truck or a distribution truck and, and, and the buses. So I think we, we need to be able to continue in this way to really uh, give the customer what he needs for his uh, assignment uh, uh, to, to minimize cost and maximize uptime and flexibility. So why, <clears throat> what drives us? I need to say something about that. And the challenges now is really, and also Corin said, so I don't think I need to push that so much, but uh, the climate is for sure the main driver and we at Skarna now have our own science-based target uh, that are put our own pressure to keep the Paris Agreement. And that means we we have a pledge to minimize, uh, reduce CO2 with 20% in our customers operation and track uh, with our products. So that is a really tough one. And to be able to do that, we it's, we need to squeeze everything in, in uh, our power in portfolio and services. And electric vehicles need to be a big part of that. So this, I would say, is actually the biggest driver for us uh, internally now to really reach this. And just to show this, that it's not only us. Uh, fro from the chart you see below there, that's from the Bill Sweden uh, report, uh, fossil free uh, fad plan, where you can see uh, the heavy vehicle OEMs that we can see that 2030, we can see that between 30 and 50% of the sales uh, sh should be electric vehicles. And uh, and I think, and if you look at this on the passenger car, this is actually faster than the passenger car acceleration. And 2025, you can see that we are in the area of 15 to 20%. And that means we need to go into haulage, at, uh, regional haulers, and then into long haulers to be able to do this. And that puts quite a lot of pressure on how we solve the charging infrastructure. Um, so, the other challenge is really to accelerate this. And I, I mentioned the product development. We put in a lot of uh, investments into this system. We need to develop the ecosystem partnership. We need to involve our customer and customer customers so they understand what is coming. And we also need to talk about this. How do we build the best infrastructure? How do we build it in time? And how do we have the policy and business model to, to accelerate this? Um, I will mention something about our experience from electric road systems. Uh, we have done that for quite some time. Uh, and we think this can be uh, one really important part of, of this uh, infrastructure puzzle to, to solve it for, for as many customers as possible and also into long haulage. Uh, we, we see this as a possibility to scale. We see that we need to scale. And I think that is something I want to emphasize on uh, coming from that chart that 2025 is really a short, that is actually now for an infrastructure point of view. And uh, that's why I will focus a bit on that. What are the requirements for scalability? And we see that we would like to have power requirements of about 200 to 450 kilowatts in this system. And, the reason for this is that we see that we will be able to bring in quite a lot of battery electric vehicles into this. So they, you have the range for quite a lot. And then we both want to have the uh, charging uh, power for driving the vehicle, but also to, to charge the battery. So you, when you leave the electric road, you are fully uh, charged and can use that for your operation. And this means you don't need to electrify every kilometer. You can have this as more of an optimum uh, dynamic charging, stretched out chargers, so to speak, instead of seeing it as an electric road. And I think the, this uh, opens up quite a lot. You don't need to do it in the cities. Uh, you are always charged when you start the day. So you need to, to optimize where this should be uh, in the best uh, the best conditions for it. 
and you can also lower the cost for the complete system or maximize the real use of this system. And we have another requirement. It needs to fit on a truck. So it needs to fit on an articulate truck. Uh, 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 so you have like one or two meter under a vehicle or you need to fit it very neatly behind the cab. And on the business side, I think uh, we still uh, have some requirement to really scale this. And I think the industry ecosystem need to be there. So you need, need to be open standards. You need to have multiple suppliers. So it's uh, safe uh, and you need common systems for a bigger region. It's, it's need to be at, on a European level uh, at least. And it needs to meet the cost of operation for the customer, of course. Uh, so I think we're quite close on all this. So, so um, it will be interesting to look in the future. Uh, I will just give a small hint from, a, from a OEM what does it mean for product development? And I would say that the experience we have is uh, mostly from catenary systems. Um, we are part of and, and follow the other systems as well. But uh, just to give you an idea, we started 2013 uh, with the catenary system. We were on public road 2016. We have two generations of trucks uh, and system for that. And 2019, uh, the German project started uh, where we can test it on, on really one of the biggest roads in, in, in Europe. And uh, I would say that with these steps, we are ready for the next step. And that is really to industri industrialization of this. So that would be mean to know what volume it is so we can reduce the cost and make it even simpler and make sure that we can produce it in a, in a good way. And uh, the experience now from, from testing in Germany, uh, they have two stretches, five kilometers by directional, both in Frankfurt, outside the airport and, and in Lübeck. And currently we have six vehicles there uh, in commercial operation for customers uh, going 24 seven. And uh, we have a plan to roll out the 15 vehicles there. And so far we have tested 200,000 kilometers and 20,000 are on the electric roads. And uh, just last week, there were a decision that they will extend the Frankfurt site with uh, uh, seven kilometers more. And they have, uh, uh, we got the order for seven more vehicles. So in total, we will be able to have uh, 22 vehicles out there on one of the biggest, most trafficked uh, European roads, uh, actually. Um, and the last slide, I say, what are the key aspects to really accelerate electric road system? And I would say that product development is a key. We need to develop the complete platform. We need to do these last steps regarding sharding interfaces uh, to really reduce the cost so, so this fits. The ecosystem have uh, uh, some steps to do still. We need more suppliers both on the uh, OEM side and infrastructure side and also involve <clears throat> the rest of, of the system with the energy system and so on. And there need to be decisions to really roll this out on a bigger scale. So we know that there is a market so we can push the button, so to speak. So I hope uh, that answered the question was what an electric road vehicle is, Peter. Yeah, that was perfect. So I understand all your thoughts and uh, it was very sh good insights that you shared and very good status update, I think. And it's fun to hear. Thank you very much, Magnus. Uh, we are moving on, uh, so please remember to post questions in the chat as they pop up. Um, we take them at the end. Okay, now, Magnus mentioned where we should build these electric roads is a difficult question, or difficult, but it needs to be considered. Um, and we have um, a special speaker on that. It's Götz Guidofalvi. He's Associate Professor at Geoinformatics at KTH. He's also head of the research program from Urban Goods in the ITRL Research Center. And he's also 
founded a startup in deep tech called Gordian. So, Götze, I would like to ask you, where do we build the electric roads, you think? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, okay. So, yeah, thank you, Peter. Uh, so where should we build these electric roads? Uh, as you know, currently uh, we are facing a number of uh, societal and transport challenges. And there are a number of technologies that are disrupting uh, the transport industry, but they can also help us address some of these challenges. Uh, one example where these technologies can help us is electric road systems, which are a viable and demonstrated technology uh, that can heavily reduce the carbon emissions of road transports. Uh, however, the charging infrastructure is quite expensive. Uh, the cost estimates are around 1 to 1 1.5 million euros per kilometer. So where to build the electric roads is very important. Uh, this obviously depends on a number of obvious parameters such as the weight and speed of the vehicles, the road incline, the vehicle battery size and the charging power. But most importantly, they depend on the past and future routes, which also define the charging opportunities of these vehicles. Uh, our approach to answering the where question is by utilizing digital movement traces that provide a wealth of information about the transport demand or the energy demand, as well as the operations. And this is actually essential to uh, better plan and optimize resource allocations, for example, uh, including charging infrastructure and electric roads. So in order to formalize this, we have uh, come up with a concept called rod-based electrification utility. Uh, what you see here is essentially transport flows uh, uh, on the road network that is denoted by the widths of the arrows. And the shade of the green denotes the battery levels of vehicles as they move on the road network. So as they move, essentially after a while, they deplete the energy in the batteries, and then they have to continue the rest of the routes on an internal combustion engine, which is shown in the black. Uh, arrows. If we electrify one of the segments, then we can define the rod-based electrification utility of this segment as the additional transport work that can be carried out in electric mode. Uh, these uh, rod-based electrification utilities cannot be calculated from simple uh, analytics. So what you see here is a depiction of some routes that contains all the information. If we calculate simple analytics, such as the densities of the starting or ending position of the objects, or the flows on the road, on the, on the segments, or even the origin destination flows, we lose a lot of information. And this doesn't allow us to actually calculate rod-based electrification utility. So we have come up with uh, new data structures that actually capture all this information and allows us to calculate rod-based electrification utility. Uh, if we don't use these rod-based electrification utilities, essentially planning and the optimization becomes like looking for an optimal solution with a faulty compass or a faulty flashlight in the dark forest. So we will never find an optimal uh, location. Another important uh, aspect is that rod-based electrification utilities are not independent of one another. And because of this cannot be pre-calculated. So what is shown here is on the left, uh, rod-based electrification utility or the electrification utility of a certain stretch uh, and another stretch in the middle, which are adjacent to one another. Because the vehicle's batteries are becoming uh, uh, basically become full after some time, uh, the sum of the two is actually uh, less than, sorry, is actually uh, more than what can be achieved by electrifying the two segments together. So this means that in order to find the optimal uh, uh, selection, one needs to consider all possible uh, selections. This here is the number of uh, particles that are in our observable universe. 
and this is the number of possible plans uh, for electric or for placing 2000 kilometers uh, electric roads in Sweden. So RBU uh, optimizations, the way we perform them allows us to evaluate the top 3 million plans against uh, millions of movement traces and due to the uh, speed and the data structures that we use, we can do this under 20 minutes. We have evaluated these uh, empirical, empirically against simulated data from some goods, the official um, uh, goods uh, simulation model or transport model of Sweden. And we have compared it against uh, alternative optimization methods, as well as some commonly discussed corridor-based plans. What we have found is that using the rod-based electrification utility optimizations, we can actually, using the same uh, infrastructure cost, electrify three times as much transport work, or uh, we can electrify the same amount of transport work with approximately 80% less infrastructure investments. So this leads to savings in the order of megatons of CO2 annually and billions of euros in infrastructure costs. Another important uh, aspect of electric roads is that one has to remember that what I've shown here is the optimization of the, uh, uh, the total, electric, the total uh, transport work uh, electrification. Uh, it makes a number of assumptions, uh, in particular, the vehicles are assumed that they will actually be all uh, electric, uh, which is not necessarily the case. And it's also important to note that there are other technologies that are able to electrify uh, particular transport applications, uh, perhaps even better than uh, electric roads. So in particular, battery electric vehicles uh, and depot charging is discussed as well as hydrogen fueling uh, and, and fuel cells are also of uh, Intel technologies that need to be considered. Uh, another aspect is that we have a lot of different stakeholders and these stakeholders have different objectives. For example, uh, the grid owners have an objective of balancing the electric demand on the grid. This has to be also considered when deriving the final uh, optimal plan for uh, transport electrification. In conclusion, uh, I try to argue that rod-based electrification utility optimization is important. In fact, uh, no presently discussed large corridor, largely corridor-based plans are cost-effective. The gaps that uh, are required are uh, are not constant. So basically placing constant gaps is not an optimal solution. The optimized plans that we find can electrify up to three times as much transport work or require 80% less infrastructure. And we have seen, or I can tell you that uh, in the experiments, we have seen that the advantages of this optimization is more prominent for system settings with fast charging and small batteries. Uh, finally, as I said, the final plan for transport electrification must consider multiple rod-based electrification utility stakeholder objectives, multiple fuel and energy technologies, as well as uh, robustness and resilience, as it was mentioned by Magnus. Uh, finally, I would like to tell you about uh, Gordian, which is a startup that I founded uh, that has the motto of making transport planning easy and effective by untangling millions of movement traces. In the context of electric roads, we are looking for strategic partners to build a multi-actor, multi-stakeholder transport energy planning tool. Uh, you can try our proof of concept at this uh, web address. Thank you, Götze. It's very interesting to hear that you see a lot of uh, opportunities and that uh, it's, a, it's a, let's say, you need to consider the optimization before the detailed planning can be done. 
No. Thank you so much. I think there will be questions for that later. Uh, but we're just moving on here at full pace. Um, so now we come to the question um, related to what's the benefit for the society in terms of uh, why we build electric roads or why should we not build electric roads from a societal economic perspective. And I have the pleasure to uh, introduce Maria Bratt Börjesson, professor at Transport Economy at VTI. Maria, can you? enlighten us on the, your perspectives of the electric road. I will do my very best. Thanks, Peter. So uh, the way I started out with this issue of electric roads is actually, as you have heard the earlier speakers and also what we know is that we have huge challenges and we have very limited resources. So the question is, um, we need to put the resources where they pay off the most. So is that electric roads? That's what we're trying to do. And I've written this paper together with Magnus Johansson and Per Kogson, and I'm going to do this very brief because I think I have only 12 minutes. Right, so we, we started out. So first, <clears throat> we try to do a cost-benefit analysis for electric roads. So how do we weigh the cost against the benefits? We focus only on long-distance trucks because we think that like short-distance trucks, they can, it can be dealt with with batteries. And uh, we do this, we, we think it's most beneficial for those because they travel long distances <clears throat> and they are traveling large share of the day. So that means that um, it will actually, if they, they can reduce their operation costs, that could be, I mean, a, a big upside. We know, acknowledge, we assume now that we have hybrids in the first place. So these, these vehicles also have a diesel engine because if there is electric roads, they will have to be able to travel outside the electrified network as well. And that means that the capital cost would be higher for these vehicles. They're costly. They need two uh, engines, basically. That means also that these higher cost of the capital cost must be offset by lower operation cost. And the operation cost can be lower because it's cheaper to run electricity, depending on the user fees. And also it depends on how large share of the distance can this truck be traveling on the electricity, which is cheaper. Uh, so that, as Götz actually shown you, that you have enormous economies of scope. That means the larger the network is, the more Beneficial is it to have this electric vehicles because it can travel longer distance. Uh, and we also have an economy of scale. The more traffic you have, the more um, the, 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 the higher benefit can you have for the same cost. Um, so what we're trying to figure out here, how large share of the network is it even beneficial to some part of the network? What part of the network is most important to electrify first? How does the cost benefit uh, ratio vary? Uh, and also, second question, is it possible to pay for the investment by user charges? Because we have the problem that if we increase the user charges so that it can pay for the investment, then fewer trucks will use it, fewer trucks, fewer carriers will find it beneficial to invest in these more expensive trucks. So there's also a balance. So that's the questions. There have been a lot, lot of discussion lately whether maybe this is all in vain, the electrical uh, roads, because the battery developments are so fast. So maybe at, at the point when we have these electrical roads, the, we can run on all heavy trucks can run on battery only op trucks. Um, we think actually the analysis is fairly transferable to that situation, because if you do a rough com calculation, this extra engine, diesel engine, can is basically roughly the same cost as a large battery that maybe can run a 40, 40 Swedish meal should be actually. So we think maybe this analysis can be roughly comparable to that situation too. Obviously then you need super fast charging at certain points in the network. So maybe the uh, cost, the investment cost is lower, but still the behavior of the carriers will be roughly the same. So as Götz has said, whoops, now my slides disappeared. Whoops. Can you still see them? Uh, no, uh, we're seeing your screen, uh, Maria. Oh, you see a paper. You yes. see my... Yep. Whoops. So did I close it? Okay, I'll open it again. There are no secrets on my sl <laughs> screen. <Excellent. laughs> All, right. All right, can you see it now? 
Yes, it's up. All right. That was only a punishment because I included the equation in a 12 minute presentation. So now I've punished. Uh, so as Gessa said, we used the SAMGOS model to do it. We are implemented, uh, electric implementing electric vehicles in that 40 and 60 ton hybrids are added in the sum goods network and just this is as i said it's very bad to include equations but it's just for you to show that this this is how we um, sum goes do the cal calculation that for each and every truck you see where the it, and the carrier trying to minimize the capital cost which is high for electric hybrids but against the uh, the lower operation cost depending on the price, how long distances you can drive on electricity, what would be the cost, what would be the use of fees. So we did, we did optimize it by each um, uh, vehicle. We have all these dynamic effects. So you have changes in route choices. You can have traffic coming from rail and maritime transport when it gets cheaper to transport by road. We have appraisal period, 15 years, which is, which is very short. Um, we've a lot of equations, which I don't show here, shows that the welfare optimal user charge would be about one krona per kilometer. And we try that. We also tried if, let's say, that you have a private investment or that the person or entity investing in the electric road is trying to maximize revenues to pay for the electric road, that in the entity would set a higher charge, about the double charge. Um, it cannot set even higher charge because then it would be more beneficial for the carriers to run on diesel. So that is sort of putting the limit there. The cost that we've assumed, I noticed is very similar, just slightly higher than the cost that Gertz um, presented for the investment in electric roads. We have taken numbers from the, the costs of the hybrids from uh, different sources as you show here, but you can always change that. So this is the results. <clears throat> so we tried three networks. The small ones only from Stockholm to uh, Norrköping, the bigger one Stockholm to Malmö and the largest one is Stockholm, Malmö, Gothenburg. Uh, and you see that the, if you only have a small network, you get very little traffic on it because it's not, um, it doesn't pay off for the carriers to invest in these trucks uh, because it's such a short distance as they, they can run on the um, uh, on electricity. When you have Stockholm to Malmö, it increases uh, substantially. So you have more than 20% of all the vehicle kilometers with heavy trucks in Sweden running on electricity. And then you get slightly more uh, when you have also in, include Gothenburg. But you see here, the most important thing is to have the stretch from Stockholm to Gothenburg. That is the most, um, that is the distance where the electric roads really pay off the most. So this is the, Results from the cost benefit analysis. I have included a couple of sensitivity analysis. We did a lot more. What surprised me was that this actually is a value for money. So you have a positive net benefit cost ratio, meaning that the benefits are higher than the costs. Uh, and you see that the, the highest um, net benefit cost ratio is for the, um, the middle network, so Stockholm Malmö. When we instead assume that the road's supposed to be paid by user charges uh, so that <clears throat> the, the entity operating the electric roads uh, are trying to maximize revenues. You see that the welfare, the cost net benefit cost ratio is declining a little bit because you have fewer um, vehicles using the electric road. So that is the payoff of who's going to pay for this. Then we also did this experiment with intermittent electric transmission. So assume that there are gaps in the electric roads, but on the other hand, the vehicles needs a little bit bigger battery. And you see that this has the highest net benefit cost ratio. So maybe this is the way to go to make gaps in it. And then just assume that the battery is a little bit lower, which increased the capital cost, but still it seems to pay off. All right, final slide. So we've shown that, with, and we use this old value of carbon dioxide that OSEC had last year. Now it's like three, four times higher. So that means that it's much more, uh, the cost net benefit cost ratio is much higher. So the value of mine is a lot higher, but we think, or I think this is more sensible number. Um, so it's beneficial, which is I think surprising. The medium network Stockholm Mama, is most beneficial, telling you that if you only build a small network, it's very difficult to realize all the benefits. And um, so that's like shows you how enormous the economies of scopes are here. 
With intermittent Intermittent electrical transmission, the benefits increases further because you can reuse, reduce the investment costs a lot. Uh, and in that case, we show that this investments could be financed by use of the charges only. Uh, but there is a big risk. Obviously, with this, this is such an investment because we have a very fast development of batteries. So there's a risk that when this once is actually realized, the, trucks can run on batteries instead, and they have become much more um, cheaper. You have these economies of scope, meaning that you need a massive network. So that means that it would be difficult. I, my guess is if you leave this to the market, this will never happen because it's, it's just a too big of a risk. Then obviously, few things. You will have boundary problems if you think that it's a have a private operator of the um, of the road. Like, what, what do you do with all the snow? Who someone is owning the road, another one one is owning the um, uh, the system. And you should also be careful because in our analysis, we have assumed that there is still diesel to run on. So that means that the cost of running on the electric road, which will be a monopoly market, cannot set who, too high user charges because then the carriers will start running on diesel instead. When the diesel engine is gone, this there's got to be something else that sort of um, make sure that the user charges would not be increased further if there's someone trying to maximize revenue. And finally, I was surprised. I thought this could never pay off, this huge investments, and clearly I was wrong. And the question is, why? How can it be so beneficial? And I think the thing is that we actually, this is not new really, this is not new infrastructure. It's the old infrastructure that is used in a more, in a smarter way, which is basically why it's beneficial. That's much better than trying to build entirely new infrastructure. And it's also both climate and cost efficient. Yes, I'm done. Thank you, Maria. That was a very uh, content rich presentation, but I think we got the message. And I really enjoyed the table that you showed with the different cases. That was super clear. Thank you. And again, remember to write your questions in the chat so that we can come back to them in the last eight minutes there. Now we move on again. We're moving at high pace here. Now we're all interested in hearing how is this going to work with payments and business models and how do we actually pay for this electric road or electricity impact. And I think it's good that we have Mats Engvall. I would like to welcome you on stage, Professor of Industrial Management at KTH. You have been studying business models for a long time and especially the electric road system business models. Please tell us what you think about the business model perspective and how we will end up paying at the end of the day. Thank you. Uh, well, I have the title, how do we pay for electricity? I will not answer that, sorry. I'm sorry to say. I'd rather talk about this in search of uh, business models for electric road systems, because I think that's one of the key challenges. It's already been mentioned today, but it's still worth mentioning uh, more. I've been following this for a while, since the beginning of uh, uh, 2009 or something like that. And we have been writing some things about this, the connection between technology and technology shifts and business model development. But I have to start with one warning or a disclaimer. I'm an academic, so I will focus on the problems and the questions rather than come with a solution. So if you expected me to give you an answer, what is the proper business model? I think you're gonna be, not be that satisfied. But this is a fascinating subject and I think if you think if, if you this is a classical uh, the classical model of how uh, technological development the typical pattern that you usually can see in retrospect you can never of course not in media res you don't know exactly where you are but on the y-axis you have performance and uh, in when we talk about electric roads we can talk about my mileage or the stretches the long stretches and on the other hand you have on the, on the x-axis you have time and uh, <clears throat> when technology develops it's usually like this. In the beginning, we have slow development. Sometimes technology takes off and you get into a phase where you have quick development and a lot of radical innovation going on. And then at some point in time, it usually matures. Uh, uh, the uh, um, easy questions or easy problems have been solved. It's becoming more and more expensive to invest in new, uh, increased performance and the technology matures. And here, we, right now, we have the electric road systems. Uh, it's um, maybe ready to take off. We have been waiting for a while, but it's um, 
It's actually here, down here. We don't know exactly what's going to happen. So this is where we are. And it's, it's typically as well is that we can see here is that you have a competition right now between different kind of technologies or different kind of technological applications, which is typically for this phase uh, in innovation processes. All up here, something has happened. Here, you usually have a more mature uh, market. And what enables that is this, the dominant design, the emergence of a dominant design. And a dominant design, which typically is somewhere, it's not, it could be a formal standard, but it's actually usually a new formal standard, a de facto standard. It's something that the market and the suppliers had agreed on that this is an okay technical design. It's an enactment of a stable technological in, uh, architecture. We said, this is a reasonable design. This is the one we like. And from that on, it, this enables the development from a niche market that you have here to a more mature mass market that you have here. And we have a lot of the dominant designs in our lives. I don't think, I know that you, if you thought about the QWERTY keyboard that you have on your computers, most of us, which is from the mid 19th, 19th century and have nothing to do with the electric keyboards of today, but still it's, it's a de facto standard that we are using all the time. Another typical uh, dominant design is a T Ford. Before the T Ford, we had uh, personal cars looked in, came, came in very di different versions and different shapes and uh, different designs and different solutions. Uh, after the T Ford, we have this is the role model for how a person car should look like. And everything is actually, uh, when we conceptualize a person car, is related to this. We always compare to this kind of basic architecture. Another example is, uh, is the iPhone that uh, set the standard for the smartphone, for instance. So here, it, and, uh, until we have this, it will be going to be difficult to get into the mass market of electric road systems. Uh, and the technical dominant design is actually also related to the enactment of the stable business models. We, have, we will have uh, a dominant business model design, so to say. And as long as we lack stable business models, it's, uh, there is usually, uh, it's held back, uh, the, the, the um, technical breakthrough is held back by this. So if there isn't a business model that fits with a new technology, that has to be developed or the technology has to adopt or it does not never break through. So you can think about it like this. We have on a, on a two by two uh, <coughs> uh, matrix, we have business models, uh, existing business models or new business models on the right hand. And you have on the vertical side, you have technology, existing technology and new technology. And for instance, if you see what's happening right now in transportation, we go from petrol to electricity is actually based on the basic, uh, the same existing business models that we have today. Or when we talk about uh, mobility as a service or uh, carpools or car sharing, you go from car to transport service, uh, companies try to change the business model from existing and you know, selling a car to selling the transport service instead. And the electric roads uh, are actually uh, addressing both of these. We need both, there's a new technology changing things up here, uh, the basic structure we have, but it also uh, requires new business models. And many of my previous speakers have already said this, but electric roads affect a number of business models and a number of markets that are interconnected together. Uh, and uh, we already talked about the ERS technology providers or the road owners. Uh, we will need road operators running these specific kind of roads. Uh, we have the energy trade companies, oh, sorry. We have the energy trade companies, uh, power grid owners, vehicle manufacturers, OEMs, the transport carriers, dispatchers, transport buyers, et cetera, et cetera. And all these markets are interconnected. And this new technology doesn't exactly fit in to the established structure that we had uh, so far in this industry or industries actually. So when you talk about business models, which and business model is a very hyped concept today. And a lot of, there are a lot of different conceptions of business model. And we usually uh, often talk about business models as this, the last one, the revenue model. Uh, 
primarily the, originally the business model concept uh, emerged in uh, when we talked about in internet doing business of internet uh, but today when uh, there is as, as i said different uh, conceptions and different a little bit competition about what is a business model but in general you can say that the business model has three basic elements and this is kind of consensus of this today you have the value proposition what is value is offered to a certain customer uh, that is a, could be a product, a service, but it's also more what, is, what kind of value does this product uh, produce for the customer. You have the value creation and value delivery. How do we create this value? And then you also have the value capture, how to appropriate some of the value produced back to the company again. And um, this is usually that we, uh, the problem is usually that we might have a good idea of a value proposition, but it's difficult to get uh, value captured back to capture value back to the uh, company or the specific actor. So when we go to if we apply this on uh, an electric road or electric ro a specific electric road, uh, you can think that uh, you can see that there are several different alternatives here. And this is of course hypothetical, but this we can also if we try to think a little bit out of the box, uh, the classical highway. Uh, with traffic vacate or the Swedish traffic administration. The value trap proposition is a classic highway. The value creation is to, to, to build a road and you have open access and you capture value from taxes while running on the highway. Uh, on the other hand, you can have an electric road system as a service. Uh, somebody builds a road and you have a, with an exclusive access to some sort of customers. This could be like a, a turnpike. Uh, or the Orison Bridge, but it could also be like a, a ski resort system where you have an access card and then you get access, uh, access, access to all the lifts and, and slopes about uh, mountains. And this can of course be a public actor, some sort of semi-public actor, private consortium building these kind of things. Third one is that you have a, like ERS transport as a service. You, pro you provide an ERS road with transports and you sell the transport services like Orlando Express or Heathrow Express uh, built by a private consortia run by private consortia. You can um, provide an ERS road and then maybe rent ERS vehicles and <coughs> then so you earn money from the, from the, the rental fees from vehicles running on the road. Or you can even go further and think about it more like the, the ones that sell uh, bring, uh, bring, uh, uh, internet access or routers, uh, services, or things like that for us. You, per, you place uh, an ERS vehicle or ERS equipment at, at different transport um, carriers. And then when they use them, they pay per mile as a router that you have in your home for your internet access. It's free when they place them out, but every time you use it, you have to pay for that. So, um, This is, for me, kind of a key change. What will emerge as a dominant business model for the electric road systems in the future? Uh, and how to enable the dominant design that we want to have as a society. And just to quote uh, Clayton Christiansen, to manage a technology shift is actually it's not a technological problem. It is a business model challenge. So, Sorry for not having any answers, but it's a fascinating subject and fascinating to see what's going to happen in the future. Thank, Thank you, you much. For listening. Thank you much. That was very interesting to hear your ideas of what the business model could be. I think it will spark a couple of questions in the chat and whoever wants some question, put it in the chat so we can take them up at the very end. There is the final speaker for the day and we will now look into sort of the ownership question or the maintenance or operation question. And Björn Hasselgren, uh, please join us. Björn is a senior advisor at Trafikverket, associated researcher at KTH. You have a lot of experience. Would you share your thoughts on how you view it from Trafikverket and the studies you have done? Yes, I'd be happy to. Hi, hi everyone. Um, I have some slides here from the on going work we do right now in the transport administration. Let's see if I can get them on the screen. Oh, where are they? Now, are they visible? 
Yes. Okay, fine. Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, John Hassigian from the Swedish Transport Administration, working in the national planning side of the transport administration, um, mainly active in projects relating to strategic planning of large infrastructure projects, often cross-border projects, often with an angle of financing and organizational perspectives, um, primarily into alternative financing, alternative than to the traditional uh, government financing of transport infrastructure. And now since some years back, uh, an extensive amount of work in the transport administration has been done around electrification of heavy road transport systems. And we have a specific program for that called the electrification program, where we look with a broad perspective uh, on the electrification of heavy road transport systems. So I will give you some insights into the things we are dealing with when it comes to organization and financing, which is the area I am primar primarily involved in. So to start with, when we uh, initiated the analysis on business models and organization and so on, uh, and I can say this has been said by or touched upon by many of the other speakers today, but this is <laughs> another version. We, we started with in the middle of the hexagon here uh, to depict how an electric road system might look like, what kind of different subsystems are there in an electrified road system for every vehicle. You have the road, and you have the vehicle, you have some power grid, and you have to connect it to the national power grid on different levels. And then uh, in this uh, system, uh, technological system and business system, you have a large number of actors. Of course, you have vehicle manufacturers like Magnus is representing. You have carriers and the transport market, um, which is very important, of course, because these guys are the ones who buy uh, trucks and use trucks. And it's a tendency that we often kind of forget that when we speak about this. So we try to drag them into discussion as much as possible. It's, it's absolutely vital how, how these actors see upon the electrification of the business models. Of course, you have to know uh, if you follow um, clockwise um, the electricity market, the electricity suppliers and the power grid companies, how they act and think about electrification. Uh, as a new technological system, we have been thinking about whether there is need for a new kind of player uh, operating the electric road system. That could be a private sector operator or it could be a government operator like the transport administration. And then we have the technology providers um, like Karin uh, proposing new technologies, what should be implemented into the road or the road surface or above. And then the road owner in the case of Sweden uh, the Swedish Transport Administration. And all of these actors, when it comes to electrified road systems, uh, have connections and, and tend to have commercial relations as well. Uh, they, they buy things from each other and they pay for services and they have contracts in different ways. So you have to collaborate with all of them over time to understand how the system might work. Uh, thinking about uh, electrification at large, we started out to, from the left with the ERS road to start with, and then we started to conceptualize how would charging systems for battery electric vehicles look like. In the, end, in the beginning, it looked like uh, they were quite decoupled. We had a development quite uh, separate from the roads. Uh, now more and more of the discussion is going on whether you should have electric roads or uh, 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 charging systems and battery electric vehicles as a competition between the two systems where they are quite close physically. And uh, as we believe in the future, they might be more of complementary systems where you might have uh, ERS systems as uh, perhaps more of loading stretches, charging stretches, as, as Magnus also mentioned, 
uh, with um, uh, charging infrastructure placed perhaps in, in depots or where the trucks are standing still overnight and lunchtime and so on. So um, you can see a number of different combinations of these two technologies. And you can say that right now we are also looking into hydrogen and fuel cells to add that technology, which is uh, of large interest to many stakeholders right now to understand how that could fit into the, to the largest, uh, pic larger picture of electrification. Uh, market segmentation is very important in uh, combination with the actor setup. Um, so if you start from the right hand here, we are working with uh, four different market segments when we try to analyze how the market might work. It's long distance transport, regional transport, city transport, and also the foreign registered vehicles, which are mainly operating on the long distance transport market. And uh, in order to analyze and understand how an electrified system might look like, it's crucial to um, treat these different sub-markets respectively since they have different uh, travel stretches. They need to some part different technology solutions with, for example, different battery sizes and so on. And also when it comes to hybridization, what kind of hybrid technology uh, or combination of technologies do you need for different uh, purposes. And then to the left, if you put that into a sketch of how a road system in, act in real life could look like, um, you have all these, these uh, bits and pieces put out in, in, in a physical environment. You have public charging, um, for battery electric vehicles, you can think of destination charging for battery electric vehicles, for example, in ports or logistics centers, and you have charging in, in, in depots overnight at home more or less. And we believe that uh, uh, charging overnight at low effects uh, or, or modest effects that will be the dominant way of obtaining energy for, for the vehicles, for the battery electric vehicles, and also the vehicles using electric roads. As we figure <laughs> or think about it right now, will also be dependent on batteries to quite a long, a large extent. So they will also be charged uh, in depots, probably. And then you have the different markets, C city, regional and, and long distance. And then we try to combine this uh, into an analysis. Right now, the uh, work is extremely um, hectic around these questions since the government, as was mentioned earlier, um, presented a number of um, assignments and new investigations in this area. Um, so if we have our Unfortunately, in Swedish uh, analysis area here, the electrified road for heavy vehicles, we have the new electrification commission uh, working on a general um, level, uh, giving advice to the minister on a number of electrification issues. We are involved in the two government assignments, the one on an assessment of the need for stationary fast charging for heavy duty vehicles along major roads, and the other one to make plans for a possible uh, rollout of ERS systems on major roads in Sweden. It's not, an, it's not a decision to build, it's, a, it's a, a question for us, how would a plan look like if the government would take a decision to build ERS stretches? Uh, so these are two very major assignments that we are working on very intensively right now, and we are to report on 1st of February 2021. So many of the um, analysis that we are performing are to be ready this and next week so that we can go into writing the report. Uh, so we are applying our calculation tools from the earlier stages, both the business economic calculation tool that we have and a social cost calculation tool uh, based on 
the different market segments, technologies, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, that we are working with right now. And then we are go internally we are going on with our analysis on on uh, fuel cells and hydrogen. We will finish that early 2021, I think, to have a calculation tool also for that. That so we can uh, compare the three technologies. And then there is a legal investigation set up uh, that is looking into all of the very difficult, very difficult indeed questions around legislation, legislation and regulations since the present energy market regulation and road, mar road market regulation, they are not prepared for implementation of electric road systems. It's, it's easier to implement uh, stationary charging. There is no law prohibiting that. But actually, when it comes to URS, it's, it's not possible from a legal point of view to build these systems right now. So that investigation, of course, is very important to look into the huge number of very complicated conflicts that, that might arise and do arise between these two major areas of legislation, electric, electricity market and road market. It, it's really very difficult. Uh, when we try to solve these uh, two government assignments on stationary charging and on an ERS plan, um, we also make these maps as everyone else do and we have had a number of them presented now. Uh, we base our ideas on how a system of 2,000 and 3,000 kilometers of electric roads could look like. Uh, no matter how you calculate, we have the roads that we have in Sweden. So all the maps look the same, even if you do a clever calculation or a very simple calculation. So some, it could look like that. It's not the final one, but it's just a simple one to the left. And when we think about how stationary charging systems might be developed, they are um, implemented from below in, in the system. So you have local stationary charging systems that we believe will be developed over time to more regional and perhaps in the end, a national system. And to give a clever answer on the two government assignments on stationary charging systems and on an ERS plan, we have to see this in combination, of course. So to Jaren, start with, yeah. Jaren, I'm gonna have, have to ask you to wrap up so we have a few minutes of questions. I will, I will. Okay, so this is how a stationary charging could develop and this is how you could combine stationary charging and ERS systems. And this is what we are analyzing right now. Uh, this is the third alternative. And the outcome of this could be a presentation like this where you see target is to reduce CO2 emissions for heavy duty vehicles by 50% at least compared to 2018. And we will have presentations in the final um, government assignments reports, both on the economics and uh, uh, operating results from a financial point of view, but also on the CO2 reduction side. And it, it's obvious that battery charged vehicles will take a large chunk of the CO2 reduction. There is a possibility to have a reduction from uh, your systems, but less so than for battery equipped vehicles, we believe. And then the introduction of more biofuels is, will be very important. This is just a sketch of, of how it could look like. It is not at all the final outcome. But reports are coming and the electrification uh, program is ongoing. So 1st of February is the next time when we will report something um, officially. Thank you. Thank you, Bjorn. That was also very enlightening. It's interesting to see how you use all this knowledge in the Transport Authority to generate some reports to the government so that they can make clever decisions. Um, that was a, a large number of questions and we have about five minutes. So I will actually pick only a few. And there was a couple of ones that I would like to highlight here. There has been one question related to uh, how much of the CO2 from transportation today is coming from cars and how much is coming from trucks. And there was some reports, uh, some numbers presented in the chat that 65% was coming from cars and 21 from trucks. Uh, I'm not sure who is the best to answer. Um, Magnus, Karin, do you have any of those numbers fresh in your head? 
Um, no, I think those were from 2016, and I, I would say it with its equivalent today. I, I don't think that uh, those levels has changed so much. Okay. 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 Thank you. Um, there was a question also related to uh, to the OEM. So this is for you, Magnus. Um, heavy duty electrification. If you look generally on the OEM approach or approaches, what different approaches do you see? What are the different OEMs looking into and, and putting their efforts on? I think uh, on the broader scale, I think we have quite similar. I think um, most OEMs are see electrification as, uh, as the next step and that really can drive this. And, I think most studies show that this is the most cost-effective system. Uh, I think we have a bit of uh, different uh, thoughts on, on um, the infrastructure and maybe hydrogen, how big part of it is it, it, it could be. Uh, so I think it's more on the more on the details. I think all OEMs are are uh, want to push electrification yeah. going forward. Uh, and that is, uh, that is the next step. And we need to start now when the infrastructure and sharding will be really important for the first step as well. And I think uh, the other steps, we need some decisions and to, to really, uh, yeah, uh, to connect to Matt's uh, point there that you need some sort of technology uh, convergence and business model convergence to scale. Uh, but I think, uh, so I think we need these kind of de decisions, but I think OEMs are quite, have s quite similar take on it actually. Okay, so you think several OEMs will be capable of, of managing, uh, you know, solutions for electric road system kind of charging? Techno no, technology wise it's uh, not the big issue and okay. i think and i think there are other oems on the on the in the audience maybe that can answer better for for their sake but uh, from a technology point i think we we can support all these kind of infrastructure yeah okay thank you um i had another there was by um uh, there was a question coming up uh, or actually thought that i picked up so Jörn, you mentioned how important it is to include the users uh, in, in the, you know, the development discussion, so to say. And this is, I think, an open question to, to the panel. You know, how much are the, the users, in this case, it would be the transport companies, the, the people that actually run the vehicles and, and operate transportation businesses, how much are they included and how interested are they? Are they ready for this, this situation happening or is it very far away from their thoughts? Magnus, do you have any comment? You can maybe start recording. Yeah, I, can, I can pitch in. I, I think that to some extent, it's it's still not not to be. It, it's more engineers discussion it, and then you you forget the human behavior. And I think from a human behavior perspective, uh, electrical roads or in motion charging, everything that increases convenience will prevail. Uh, and I think that's a perspective that is not so often discussed in this context. Um, so I, I think uh, we should include them much more in these discussions. What do you think, Magnus? Are these, these uh, stakeholders ready to get involved? Uh, you're muted. You need to turn on the volume. Uh, I think the stakeholders are involved, but I think uh, to scale, we there needs to be a market. I think uh, this is one of the biggest hurdles for electric road system, I think, is that uh, it's not that is to be control over the decisions. So I think, uh, so the stakeholders are there, but we need to define the market, so to speak. Yeah. Bjorn, what is your take on that? You have from the transport authority, you have also to, you know, look at the money spent on an infrastructure and it needs to be used. So I guess you have interviewed lots of users. What's your take? Yeah, we, we try to involve them as much as possible on different levels, both nationally, regionally and locally. And um, it, it's, it's crucial to talk to them. It's very interesting to talk to people who actually own trucks and drive them since you learn a lot. 
And of course, you see that the uh, more short-term perspective and the financial perspective um, is very important to them. So it, it's hard to see that a large number of, of owners of trucks would change to electrification in a situation where it's more expensive or much more expensive than the, the alternative. Then the tricky, oh, there are many tricky questions, but one tricky question is of course, uh, what is the alternative? Right now you can see diesel as an alternative, but in a short while you will see quite expensive alternatives to, to electrification. And so then things might change. So the setup of taxes and other incentives that could enable a transition is very important. That's also part of the, the analysis that we are doing right now. What, what would it take for a larger number of users, owners of trucks to actually change to new technologies? All right. Okay. Thank you, all the speakers. We had millions more questions, but I'm sorry to say that we run out of time now. Uh, and I would suggest to all of you to, if you have questions, you now have contact points with a lot of people here. There is activities going on in Germany. There's lots of activities going on in Sweden. Uh, there is some kind of scale up happening at some level and there are lots of thoughts and, and reports going on and analysis. So what we talked about today, is something I think we'll see emerge decisions on merging in quite near future. But please feel free to re reach out to, to the different people involved in the, in the discussions today if you have more questions and so forth. And I then hand back to Anna, maybe a final word from you, and then I think we will wrap up. Yes, I, I think I, I, I just would like to thank all of the speakers very much for today. I, I bring with me uh, in motion charging uh, carring. I, I think that was a really uh, a good way to express it and uh, that electric roads is not uh, like it, it's complementing charging. It's another way of, of charging um, the vehicle. So I, I have a lot of takeaways from all, all of the speakers uh, also. Uh, as we wrote uh, in the chat, uh, we will try to to uh, answer them some, some more questions uh, together with the uh, with the speakers today when we uh, and put it on the post on the ITAR web page um, because we get got so many uh, interesting questions and a super interesting dialogue going on uh, and finally I would just like to uh, th say thank you to the breakfast seminar team for arranging this in a very, very, very uh, nice way. Uh, the team is led by Bav Navadadi and uh, Erik Anglöv for the technical support. Uh, and to, yeah, a lot of thanks to the whole of the team that make this work so very smooth and uh, did an excellent planning. So with that, I say also, wish you everyone a Merry Christmas, uh, have a nice weekend and uh, see you in the next uh, ITRL breakfast webinar um, next year. Thank you all. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye.